Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming um, early and on time and for joining us for today's Capability Circle Stack Up Series session on the future of case and community work. My name is Faith and I am part of the SDT OD team and we're excited to be bringing today's Capability Circle Stack Up Series to you. Um, as we are still expecting a few more participants, we will start in a couple of minutes, but in the meantime, just some administrative points to take note of. So firstly, uh, for us to better engage with one another, kindly rename yourselves with the naming convention that you see in the chat. Um, and I am sure everyone is familiar with the Zoom functions uh, by now, uh, hence we would appreciate if you can mute your mics during the presentations so that we can all enjoy good uh, audio quality. And also let's switch on uh, our cameras to meet each other face to face. So if you want to go ahead, adjust your hair or outfit and let's meet face to face. Um, and if you wish to show your support for anything that is said during the session, such as by giving an applause, feel free to use the reaction button. Um, we will also be recording this session, so just to give everyone a heads up. And um, at the same time, um, it, because today we will be having a few tech demos, um, demo of the systems and apps. So if you want to um, see clearer and you want to have a bigger uh, image of the screen that's being shared, you can click um, the view button on the top right hand corner and select side by side speaker. Yeah, so that will enable you to see only the speaker who is presenting and um, enlarge the view of the slide presented. Okay, so um, also do note that we will be using pigeonhole for today's Q&A segment. If you have any questions during the session, you can indicate them in pigeonhole. So to access the pigeonhole session, you may click on the link uh, that is going to be shared in the chat as well, or you can scan the QR code on the slide. Um, but don't worry if you didn't manage to catch the link or the QR code now, we will again share the details before the Q&A segment. So, um, yeah, so we also uh, want to share that at the end of the session, we will be having um, a feedback form. So please participate in the feedback form um, and as it will help us to know how to improve for future sessions. Thank you. Hi, a very good afternoon, everyone. So uh, welcome again to today's Capability Circles Tech Up Series session on the future of case and community work. Thank you for joining us today. Um, before we dive in, just a gentle reminder for everyone to kindly name your, rename yourselves with the naming convention that is um, pasted in the chat. And also do know that we'll be using the pigeonhole for today's Q&A segment, but we will be showing the details for the pigeonhole later before the Q&A, so don't worry about that. Okay, great. Um, let's make a start. Today, we're very excited to have our guest speakers with us from three different um, SSAs and the vendors that they have worked with for the systems or maps, uh, sorry, our apps that they will be sharing with us. So a huge thank you to all our speakers for joining us today. And we will leave them to introduce more about themselves during their respective segments. Um, maybe we'll start off with the program first. Our program today is quite straightforward. We will start off with some context setting, uh, followed by sharings and demos by our guest speakers. After that, we will go into the resource sharing segment which will be followed by a Q&A and feedback session. So once again, um, seek all your help to participate in the feedback form um, before you leave. It will really help us to know how to improve for future sessions. Um, lastly, we will also be sharing some more contact details before the session officially ends if you wish to contact us after. So um, before you came today, did you wonder why this topic was chosen for the session and how it is relevant to the social service sector? You don't have to answer us now, but perhaps you can keep that in mind um, as I seek to paint the context before inviting our guest speakers to share more. 
So let me start broadly. As we have shared previously in our EDMs, today's uh, TUS session will focus on the digitalization domain under the OHFSS, the Organizational Health Framework for Social Services. As most of you would have already known, the OHFSS is a framework launched for the sector to diagnose and monitor their organizational health over time. So we hope that this session will strengthen your capabilities in digitalization and that you will be able to put into put your learning into practice, especially for organizations that have done your self-assessment and found that digitalization is an area of improvement for your organization. So on the topic of organizational health assessments and diagnostics, if you're looking for a consultant to determine your organizational health as, as a third party and develop a robust organizational health strategy, you can sign up for the Organizational Health Diagnostic Scheme. So more details will be shared later on in the resources segment, and you can also contact us using the emails that we will share later. So if you're curious to find out more, um, you can click on the links that we will share now in the Zoom chat for your OHFSS and OHDS journey. So don't worry if you miss the links, we will share it again at the end, and we'll be sending you all this information after the session. So that is the broad aim for us to um, improve our organizational health, especially in the domain of digitalization. But zooming in, we are also aware that being bogged down by tedious and manual work processes in case and community work is one of the pain points faced by the sector. So today's session really aims to inspire you into action, to tap on digitalization as an enabler, to begin to address this pain point in your agency. So with that, let us now invite our first set of guest speakers, Jasmine Chia from uh, Monfort Care at Marine Parade FSC and Sean Tan from Kilsa Global to introduce themselves and they will share more about their work on a case allocation system. They will also do a short demo at the end. Jasmine and Sean, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking time today um, to listen in, uh, to hear more about how our organization adopted this system. Uh, before we begin the presentation, I would like to uh, also uh, introduce all of you to my co-speaker, who is Imra. Uh, she too, like me, is also one of the senior social workers in Marine Parade FSC, and we are both doing case allocation for our agency. So we will both be uh, presenting today. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. So for uh, Marine Parade FSC, we are under this uh, bigger umbrella called Monfort Care. Uh, in Monfort Care, we have other centers as well, uh, such as uh, Big Love Specialty Center, uh, Good Life, uh, SAC, as well as two other FSC, uh, which are Creta Ayer, FSC, and Ad27. So in fact, uh, as we are speaking here right now, uh, our two other sisters, FSC, uh, KA FSC, and Ad27, they are also embarking on this journey as well of uh, adopting case allocation system uh, in their case assigning. But for our FSC, uh, we are the ones who did the pilot run. So that's why we are here to share with all of you about our journey, the challenges, um, as well as the benefits that we have gained from adopting this system. For those of you uh, who may not be um, familiar with what FSC does, uh, this is just a broad stroke in terms of the core services that uh, FSCs in general, uh, we, we do. So these four areas are information and referrals. We attend to walk-ins, uh, clients really from, um, all the way from cradle to grave. We accept all types of clients. Uh, we don't differentiate them in terms of their uh, gender, age, and, and whatever it is. So long as we are able to assist them, we will take in the clients. We do case work as well as counseling. And we also have a group work programs as well as community work. Now with, uh, the, uh, with us resuming back to face-to-face -face sessions. So without further ado, I would I will zoom in directly to uh, this case allocation system and uh, how it came about. This is the agenda for my sharing. So firstly, I just want to uh, share a bit more about the context of how it comes about. Initially, we had uh, discussions with Capel in terms of how uh, in FSC we are able to cut down on our time in case assigning, which we realized was becoming a problem for case allocators because it was taking up a lot of our time when we had to uh, 
spend a lot of time to find out the existing case look of workers or staff, which changes every day. Um, and also uh, there was this uh, huge mental load that the case allocators were struggling with as well to have to decide how to uh, match the new case to the staff as well. And one of the drawbacks that we see in the manual tracking of case distribution was that there were irregular updates as well as incomplete data. So we realized that this is one of the pain points and it was just not working out for us. So with that, we came up with this solution together with Capel, which is to come up with a case allocation system based on an algorithm that we provided to Kilsa which later on we identified as the uh, vendor that we have chosen to help us to come up with the prototype for the case allocation system. And then we gave them, uh, of course, in more details, which uh, later on Sean will be sharing uh, through the demo. But these are the three main areas that we came up with, which is firstly in the area of competency. Uh, what competency does the staff has, whether it matches with the presenting issues of the new case. And secondly, of course, is the case load, whether this worker has the capacity to take on a new case. And lastly, uh, is the language ability. So over here, you can see uh, the timeline as to uh, how when we first started all the way till now, uh, when we eventually launched this system in our FSC on the 1st of April last year. So to date, we have already been using this system for close to a year actually, yeah, about, about nine months. And uh, later on, uh, my colleague will be sharing more about the pros and cons of using this system. So as you can see here, we started with a discussion with Capel from March 2021. And subsequently, uh, we trained our staff uh, in three batches. The first training uh, was targeted on the more senior staff uh, because the senior staff would undertake case allocation. And then subsequently, we had a pilot run uh, 21st of March 2022 uh, with 16 of our staff, which is half of our staff strength. And then uh, eventually, we trained the rest of our staff and then we launched it in uh, 1st of April. Okay. So in terms of the opera operationalization of this system, uh, three steps to it. Firstly, the caseworker will need to key in the information uh, of this new case to the system so that the case allocator will receive a prompt on the system that there is a new case ready to be assigned out. And after that, based on the configurations that has already been input into the system, the system itself will then recommend a list of workers for us to assign the specific case to. So as I mentioned previously, when we see a new case ready to be assigned, we ourselves will need to speak to the individual supervisors as well as the staff sometimes to check in on whether they are capable or able to take on the new case. But with this system in place, the system then assists us to be able to come up with a list of uh, potential workers who can take on this case. And then lastly, uh, we will assign, the system itself will assign the case to the worker. But of course, it will be done manually uh, meaning that we will be the ones who will click on the assigning to this particular worker based on the recommendations. Please let me know if I'm speaking too fast because I'm mindful that we only have 10 minutes to, to present. So a lot of the details maybe later in the Q&A, uh, you all can ask questions for clarification. Okay, so next uh, I will pass the time to my colleague Imra who will be sharing about the pros and cons of this system. Sorry, Imra, are you speaking at the moment? It's a little bit soft. Okay. Uh, hello, yes. Are yes, you that's great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry about that. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, now I'm sharing about the pros and cons of the system that we have actually started. Uh, in terms of uh, case law information, as mentioned by the earlier on, it's a lot of time for us. Uh, because you know uh, it's all in the system, so we do not actually have to check with the staff or the supervisor. Because in the system we have information about 
how many caseload are they handling at the moment? Yeah. And for it also saves us time in terms of the email. In the past, manually, we had to send an email uh, to the case worker when we assigned the case. And before that, the case intake worker would actually send us an email to inform us that the case is ready for assignment. So with this system, it actually saves us uh, time. Uh, and then uh, each time we allocate a case, there will be an auto-generated email sent to the case uh, worker assigned, as long as also CC to their supervisors and the intake workers. So they're all in the loop. And uh, on top of that, we also get reminders for intakes that is still in draft modes in the system or under enhanced intake. Uh, so that at every seven, uh, nine and 14 days, we do get email to remind us that this system is still under inquiry and uh, whether when is it ready to be uh, assigned, we will inform the, the intake allocators, caseworker will be informed so that they will let us know. Yeah. And uh, for the data analysis part, every month actually we used to manually generate the statistics. Yeah, but for now with the system, we actually have it uh, all in the data. So it saves us time in terms of the monthly tracking of the intakes and the inquiries. Yeah, and uh, the analysis also has got presenting issues. Yeah, uh, for the cons, right? Uh, sometimes we do need to do an internal case transfer. So this is not actually captured in the system. And sometimes technical glitches do occur, uh, but uh, when we surface it, the vendor will usually address it. So on and off, it does happen. And another con is that some of the statistics we have, uh, because there's duplicates, it doesn't tell. Next, Jasmine. So in summary, uh, like what uh, Jasmine shared earlier, uh, the administrative time for us in case allocation is much reduced uh, with this system. And it also prompts us in terms of tracking the intakes to ensure that these intakes are not missed out. It also eases the mental load of the case allocator because uh, offhand we have a uh, number, you know, of how many case worker, uh, how many cases the case worker have at the moment. So when we allocate, the system actually prompts us to have a choice of the social workers to allocate the case to. But we do need to also exercise judgment because some cases are more complex. So the presenting issue may not have the underlying issues. So we need to also exercise judgment when we allocate cases. And we do have an overnight function to allow us to skip the first person uh, uh, recommended to be assigned a case so that we can assign it to the next person that we feel are more suitable to handle the case. Yeah, I think uh, that's all for now. Sean would do a demo I think, to illustrate further so that you can better understand what we are actually uh, referring to. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, my name is Sean. I'm the partner and the uh, solution provider for the case allocation system. Uh, let me just put on to my slide presentation mode. Okay, so what I'm going to do is a, a live demo, which you'll be seeing, uh, you know, as per what Jasmine and Imran has shared earlier on the features. Uh, today, the system is what we call as the case allocation uh, system itself. And in short, this system allows you to customize uh, accordingly to your organization's parameters and rule settings that you may have for your case workers. Uh, you are able to intake as what uh, Jasmine Imran shared earlier. And importantly, the recommendations of the case workers that are assigned to the specific cases are all automated and you'll be able to also do analysis around it. Uh, today, demo will cover four key areas. One is to demonstrate how flexible the system is. Uh, two is to show you how you can upload uh, very simply by uh, just uh, uploading your CSV file and a location plus the management report. Uh, I would also be using a, a scenario uh, to say that the client uh, may have a specific issue on example family violence. Uh, he or she may be uh, needing a, a caseworker that is able to communicate in Chinese and perhaps due to some uh, special needs, uh, you know, hearing difficulties and so on, um, they may need also 
a caseworker that is able to do sign languages, all right? And the example I'm going to use over here, the name of the client is called Gabby, okay? Uh, I'm going to stop sharing this and move on to the uh, live demo system. Okay, so what you're seeing is actually a live demo system with mock-up data. All right, so uh, the first part I'm going to demonstrate is a configuration. So under configuration, you have the job row, which is able to help you to determine the maximum number of cases that a caseworker can handle, plus also the type of presenting issues that can be assigned to the workers. So take, for example, you may have uh, different levels of uh, social workers. Uh, they may be able to handle, you know, 10 cases, 20 cases, 30 cases. Every single one of them can be customized accordingly to what you think the load should be for the caseworker. So take, for example, an associate caseworker over here may be able to handle up to 60 cases. This is just an example. So in this case, you may say that no, 60 is too much. Uh, he or she may be only able to handle 20, for example. Okay. So you can just simply key on 20, update, and the system will take into consideration in terms of the caseload before the allocation happens. All right. uh, if you click on issue, over here, uh, you can see the example. Uh, the issue is actually on accommodation and shelter. You are able to actually take prioritization all right, because this allows you to uh, filter allows you to prioritize uh, the cases accordingly to the issue. So you can say that example for the issue of accommodation, uh, the first priority may be assigned to an associate uh, social worker, followed by maybe social worker one, social worker two, or even to a senior or to a lead. So you can prioritize it accordingly and the system will decide. Uh, you are also able to say that for such specific issue, you do not want a specific the, the worker to be assigned to. So all these things can be set accordingly. All right. Then if you move on to the case worker, this is where uh, as a user, you're able to view the case worker data or update the respective demographics accordingly. So example, in your organization, you may have uh, different case workers. Uh, they may have uh, ability to speak uh, multiple languages and so on. Uh, you can update them accordingly. You can even put on, uh, you know, perhaps who can be doing sign languages and so on. So uh, the first part of, of what I've just demonstrated allows you to configure uh, in accordance to your organization requirements. Okay. Then next, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, you now need to upload all your intakes of clients. Uh, this is the screen where you can choose file. You can simply upload your CSV. All right, and your, your CSV, it comprises of all your clients' uh, information. So again, this is another mock-up. So uh, a very simple click on the button and you can actually have your CSV uploaded. All right. With that being done, you move on to the third part, which is where the system starts to do the allocation. So if you go to case management, under case management itself, uh, this is just an example. Uh, you have example, uh, earlier what uh, Jasmine and Imra mentioned, Draft mode, confirm, as well as close. So draft meaning cases that has yet to be assigned. All right. So under yet to be assigned, you have a total of 14 uh, cases. And the example I'm going to give is Gabby. So if you click on Gabby, uh, as you can see over here, it's still transparent. There will be a color coded uh, shortly. So Gabby has not, uh, Gabby is going to be handled by the referral worker, right? So the referral worker right now would be saying that, okay, Gabby, um, you have to put in some of the mandatory fields. Gabby needs to match languages uh, because she needs Chinese speaking, she needs sign languages, uh, and you may need to key in other parameters. Okay, after you've done that, um, she is ready to be assigned. All right. So once that is done, when you update the case, you can see that Gabby now will be color coded. All right, color coded in green would mean that when the allocator logs in, uh, he or she would know that this is ready for assignment. All right. Uh, while this is all happening, uh, the system is already, uh, you know, uh, the rules, the, the algorithms are already happening at the back end. Right. So immediately when you on allocate, you can see that uh, the client uh, have uh, the case is actually on family violence. The client is Gabby, as I mentioned to you. 
Uh, over here, what you can see is the whole list of caseworkers, those that have passed and those that have failed. All right. Uh, and earlier, like what uh, uh, Imran mentioned as well, uh, you make the final decision in terms of who you would like to assign. But in this case, system would recommend, all right, Christy Ting as the one of the caseworker, the lead social worker. Uh, she's able to handle it because her caseload is, example, uh, still zero. Uh, she has the ability to handle this specific issue. She's able to do sign languages and perhaps able to speak Mandarin. So with that, system would recommend um, uh, Christy is one of them. Okay. So when you when you click on Christy, uh, you know there's a checkbox over there, uh, and you go next. You can go back to the case and you can see that Christy is assigned. All right, as simple as that. Okay. Uh, last but not least, uh, after the allocation is done, uh, at the end of every month, uh, management may want to do analysis. Uh, this is where you are able to go into what we call analysis mode and under report data, you have many different options actually. So take, for example, you want to see uh, presenting issues. You may want to see uh, client demographics and so on. Um, yeah. So you can see the different issues that are happening. Uh, you can also look into a summary of your case workers, uh, case load, for example. So Jeremy, if you go to the case workers, okay, over here, you can see that uh, all your case workers, you can have a quick view in terms of the number of cases they are handling every month. You can download as CSV, uh, you can download the pictures as images to incorporate in your presentation and so on. So, so the whole system, as I uh, just recap, you are able to have flexibility to tailor it according to your uh, workers' uh, capacity, competency, caseloads. Uh, you are able to uh, do the allocation in the in the automated fashion, but yet have the flexibility to have manual intervention. Last but not least, uh, you know immediate uh, report generation for management uh, summary. Uh, okay, I came to an end of my live demo. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the interesting sharing, Jasmine, Imra, and Sean. We will now invite Jasmina Begum from AWA and Emil Ng from Thundercode to share more about the appointment management system that they worked on together. So similarly, we will be leaving them to introduce themselves and there will be a short demo of the system at the end of their segment. So Jasmina and Emil, please. Okay. Thank you, Faith. Hi, everyone. I'm Jasmina, the Assistant Manager of, uh, for Operations from AWA Family Services. Um, so basically, my role uh, entails overseeing the admin and ops team in the Family Service Centre as well as the Transitional Shelter. So for our FSC admin team, mainly we uh, have to ensure smooth functioning of the centre, which also includes managing the front desk duties, attending to walk-in clients or referrals that we receive via emails or phone calls. So one of the things that we noted, right, was that, um, you know, SWs, they do spend a lot of uh, time in uh, scheduling appointments uh, or even sending reminders to our clients about their upcoming sessions. And sometimes, you know, the clients don't really turn up for the sessions and then this cycle continues. So one of the wish lists that we had as an, as an agency was um, about having an automated system which allows the SWs to schedule appointments and remind clients about the upcoming uh, session uh, at the convenience of the SWs. And this will, uh, you know, we are, and also to hopefully it will reduce the man hours that spent on, um, you know, calling clients to, uh, to attend the appointments now. And from the admin perspective, right, it's also to allow us to have an overview of the SW schedule and availability, especially when, uh, you know, when we know that, you know, SWs can be very busy. So uh, it's also a way that the admin can also route certain inquiries or client uh, requests for the SWs to follow up. Okay, so um, next slide, please. So um, as such, that's when, uh, you know, AWA Family Service Centre, uh, we partnered with, uh, you know, Capel and Thundercoat. And then, uh, you know, this uh, appointment management system was, uh, you know, implemented. So mainly the, the key thing is that, you know, we are able to, um, you know, sync our, with the, this system allows us to sync with the Microsoft calendar that allows us to streamline the scheduling of reminders. So I think it was a very good opportunity for us to, for the SWs to save time in sending reminders uh, to the clients. And it also allows us, allows them 
to update the session to reflect the uh, changes in the session as well. Then the secondly, it's also about how SWs were able to confirm the appointments with the clients via auto notification and also remind them about the upcoming sessions. So this is very much automated. Yeah, and as a result, we uh, I think we were able to see there's an increased attendance rate by the clients uh, because there's more consistent and customized uh, reminders set, sent to them. And I think uh, last but not least is also about how uh, for, this, uh, for the users like the SWs, also able to replicate this appointment. So it's not about every time calling, making uh, phone calls after phone calls. It's just you go through the system, you replicate it, and you're able to recreate the follow-up appointments with the clients uh, after meeting them. So I think as an organization, you know, uh, there was about, uh, you know, 88 man hours uh, per month saved, which is quite a significant number because this allows the SWs to focus more on their core work, which is um, more readily and with ease. So I think that's the, the key thing that we saw out of this um, implementation of the appointment management system. Next slide, please. Okay, so so basically, how this system works is that um, you know there is this uh, uh, basically the social worker, uh, you know, uh, he or she will agree with the client on the upcoming uh, I mean client session, and then will set up the appointment in the system, and then once it's confirmed, right, then they will go on to the system to to input the de details, and then the system will generate an auto reminders which are sent directly to the client via WhatsApp or via SMS. So the SWs are also able to schedule the frequency of the reminder messages, which is also very much uh, uh, customized for each client. And last but not least, uh, the SWs will also be able to update the session status, whether it's uh, postponed, cancelled, or even for the upcoming next session. And I guess the good thing out of this is that, you know, it's uh, able to sync with the Microsoft calendar. So in that sense, for those uh, of us who are active users of the calendar, Microsoft calendar is all updated. Uh, and, you know, our appointments, our, our calendar is all updated. So I guess that's the, the, the key thing that we looked at. Now. And as a result, it's also able to track the client's responders and also uh, attendance of the session. So this is you know, which we can quickly capture in our case recordings as well. Okay, so with that, I will hand over to Emil. Uh, he's from Thundercode, uh, who will do the demo uh, as well. Over to uh, you, Emil. All right. Thank you, Jasmina. All right, so I... Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Hi. All right, so uh, let me share my screen. Right. Uh, so, so while I'm setting up, yeah. So I'm Emil from Thundercode. So I'm one of the directors, and I'm also also like a support the, the solution architects. So Thundercode is, a, is in, it's an IT company that focuses on digital transformation consulting as well as, uh, as well as and and basically digital solutions for the non non profit and social service space. So this is one of the things that we've been working on. Uh, right. Okay. So uh, one of the things that uh, what, what you can see. We can see my screen now, right? One of the things that we noticed is that a lot of agencies they have a lot of different systems. So we're trying to reduce the number of logins. So immediately right away, you can see that they don't need to remember a new set of passwords. They can just log in with their Microsoft account and at the same time set up the permissions needed to synchronize with their calendar, etc., which the system does a lot of, right? Okay. Um so we try to keep things as simple as possible. This is just a dashboard. There's only three, three or four tabs at the side, so fewer functions. And things like that. All details. Uh, they don't need to set up the profile manually. Everything, everything is all pulled from the Microsoft profile. But of course, uh, a lot of times our agencies, you know, if I my name right might be quite long. So importantly, right, we have a way for them to of course to customize it a little bit here and there. Say that okay, uh, I want to be known to my clients as Mr. Ng. So I just write Mr. Ng here and I save so that the clients won't see though. How come this fellow talking to me? Very long name, right? It's like this short name. Right. So I'll just go through the things bit by bit and show you how, how some of these things can be customized and tailored to, to actually help your case, the casework process. Uh, right. So um okay, so over here, um where you send so as you can as Jasmina uh, uh, explained, this idea was to be able to send reminders to clients to say, please turn up for appointments. So a few things that we kind of need to customize here. Right. What the first thing is how often do I want to send the reminders? And the second thing is, what do I send in the reminder context, right? Because different clients will have different 
quirks or keep or like different kinds of like things. Some clients might be offended if you keep sending mail reminders. They, they may not need so many. Some clients are like maybe they don't turn up very often, so you need to remind them like a few days before, the day before, etc. So this system actually what you can do, you can just create, just go in here, and then just figure out like for example, I just setting up that I want to set remind the client by SMS three days before and on the day itself, and you just adjust, adjust it, and then you can save it. And as long as you use this template, right? Sorry. As long as you use this template, you will be able to um, um, basically uh, follow that schedule, right? Then same thing for the temp for the template, which is what to send the clients, right? Uh, you notice that some some clients maybe they are Mandarin speaking, you know, and they are or they speak um, they're more familiar of using Bahasa Melayu, for example. So this one basically you can just adjust it, uh, adjust the templates. And you can put different things that you want to include based on the appointment details that you set up with the client. So this is very similar to how if you do like a, a mail merge program or something like that, maybe used to if you do marketing before, it's basically filling up the details and you know auto populate the details like this. So this is an example I I will show, right? So um for now the system actually sends mess, uh, reminders through SMS, right? Um, there's also an option to, we are exploring an option of using WhatsApp because some clients prefer WhatsApp and other forms of communications as well, right? Which also include things like automated calls, et cetera, which I'll run through in a while. Okay, so uh, th this tab I I'm showing now is called the client's tab. The client's tab is where basically you the social worker will fill in and say, this is the client's under my name. And they also have opportunity to organize them into groups. So often you have clients and then maybe you have cases. Maybe you want to organize your clients into cases. So like I have a family case and then I put the father, the mother, maybe the grandparents. And because I'm going to meet different people, different phone numbers, then you can organize together. And on top of that, if you need to send a message to the entire group of people, there's an opportunity to broadcast. So for example, I have three people in this in this group. This person does have a number, maybe it's a child. And this two is maybe the two, two of the family members. And then maybe I want to send a broadcast and say, hey, by the way, please please do something. So this is basically a way for you to just quickly send an SMS to them and communicate to them, send a reminder, please prepare something before having to set up an appointment. And this is one of the broadcast features that we have built as well, right? So yeah, I showed you the clients. I showed you the broadcast features. So maybe let's go into setting up an appointment. I mean, that's the whole point, right? Okay, so let's look at John Tan, family case one, um, phone number. I can click here to set up an appointment, right? And you'll notice that the first thing that this system does is that uh, it actually pulls all the information from my Outlook calendar on the day itself. So I don't end up, oh dear, I booked myself and I double booked myself, right? Or they don't have to go and double check their, the Outlook and see. So maybe when they're on the call of the client, they can go to open the system, pull out their name, and then they maybe look through here. And then they say, figure out, okay, I have a free slot from 11 to 12. Are you free? For example, okay. So uh, in order not to interfere with my calendar, this is synchronized to my actual calendar, right? I'm quite a busy person. You can see that today is uh, the thing here, right? Um, let's let's do maybe let, let me let, let me do on a Saturday when I have absolutely nothing going on. Okay, All right. So uh, maybe I'll I'll say I want to do an appointment from the nine o'clock to ten o'clock over here, right? And I want to do it. Maybe I want to do it as a as a home visit, right? So you you can basically do different things. You can set it as a home visit. You can you can set it up as uh as different kinds of visits. You can even do online. So what online does is that uh you can set it up as like I want to do it over Zoom or I want to do it over te over over Teams or whatever like meeting format channel you use as long as they support a connection. You know a way to create programmatically. And what happens is that the Zoom link or Teams link will be sent via SMS to the client so they can open it and then you know join from their phone etc. Right. So, and there's also an option to do a booking as well. So, for example, I want to book and I want to book the a room, right, in my agency. I can say I want to book to a, a room, and then you you basically will check through, right, and see okay what room is available. You can see that uh, meeting room C is not available, so I don't book it by mistake. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. This one. This one is basically a, a kind of Microsoft kind of based system, but then it, of course uh, there's also an opportunity to link it with any system, including Google, as long as there's there's some there's a, it can be there's a connection and it provides the necessary connections that I can set it up. So yeah. Okay. Um so I'm just gonna do put this as a home visit, right? And I will use the you can set up the reminder schedule. So maybe I just say I want to set SMS three days before and the day itself. And the template, I'll just use the standard with RSVP template. So please, please uh I'll come in home appointment, right? And then I click then once I save, right? It will create the appointment for me, right, in my Outlook calendar, right, as well as in this system, 
right? And then it will basically you can see you can see over here. Uh, and then you can actually once the appointment go through, you can actually say that oh, this person didn't turn up, for example. And as uh, what Jasmina mentioned, there's no need to recreate all the appointment details. You can just duplicate the appointment, all the details, whoever you're inviting is going to show up, and then you just adjust the date, and then you send a new reminder to the client, right? So maybe I just go through how it looks like to the to the client, right? So, um, so okay. So um, as you can see over here, right? Uh, this is this is synchronized. I think it's a bit small, but uh, this is synchronized to my to my phone SMS. And you can see that I immediately got a a message here. Say hi, uh, John Tan. Mister Ng has scheduled a message with you at this time. If you cannot make it, please let us know here. So this link over here, basically, is an opportunity for the client to basically click on it and then say, "Hi, I can't make it for this appointment. Uh, I would like to reject." Right. And if I do click, I want to reject, right, which I will do here, right? What happens is that over in the system, right, the when I refresh it, you can see that the client has declined. So and the social worker will receive a notification that this client has declined and therefore they need to go go back, check in, and reschedule the appointment. So this allows you to quickly kind of have a an avenue for the client and to quickly kind of accept or, re or reject it, similar to how if you send a email invitation to people, they can also call, accept and reject and RGP that way. So this really reduces the amount of back and forth and makes it very automated. And the reminders also prevent them from like, oh, I don't turn up and things like that, right? So, okay, they don't prevent them from not turning up, but they reduce the likelihood and at least they will inform you if they not they don't turn up. So there's a less of showing up to a place and then the person doesn't turn up, right? Okay. Um, then, um, then, okay, so this is the basic system, right? So we're still in enhancing the system here and there working with uh, different people, including uh, Ewa, right? And some of the requests they have, like, I want a dashboard, I want to see reports. So because of the fact that you can actually track the attendance, like this person didn't turn up, this person turned up, you can check whether from this client, maybe this person didn't turn up or didn't turn up. You can also track, for example, basic other things, like for example, this is some of, this is a, a prototype that we are working on of showing how many, how many clients a person has and basically looking at the follow-ups, making sure that people, because if you set an appointment, means you follow up with the person, so you can track that this person has actually done the correct frequency of follow-ups, etc. So these are some of the new features that we are looking into incorporating, which are still in, still in testing at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's all. Shall I? I will hand over to the next presenter. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Jasmina and Emil. Uh, there's more in store for us with our next sharing by Zuying Teng from Boys Town Youth Reach and Philip Park from Kilsa Fatos on the community map app that they worked on together. So likewise, they will do a quick introduction of themselves and you can look forward to a demo of the app at the end too. Zuying and Philip, please. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming and hanging with us on a Wednesday afternoon. So I'm Tseng from Boys Town. I manage the team at Youth Reach. So we are the outreach arm of Boys Town. So essentially, we're the only department that's not on the Bukit Dima Hill. We're all the way in the Kampong of Tampanese um, in a void deck space. And what we do is that we engage at-risk youth, both male and female, from the ages 10 to 24 on the streets. So outreach is a big component of our work. Um, and I have Philip here with me. Um, he's very kindly agreed to help me with my slides in true OPA style. So thanks, Philip. And you get to hear from him a little bit more later on. Yep. So next slide, please, Philip. Let me take you through kind of the pain points about why um, we decided to really start doing this app or working with um, NCSS and then with Capel and Kilsa Fatos on creating this. So if I take you through a story or so you can help visualize kind of what is the problem that we face on the streets? I think that would be very helpful. So imagine we have outreach team, we go out maybe twice or thrice a week at night and we get into our van, we comb the streets, we see a group of youths hanging out. So we decide to approach and engage. And maybe it's a group of 10 people and there are three workers there. So we might have to split up. So as we split up and meet different groups uh, or subgroups, we realize that there's a big component where we have a lot of information. So an outreach log is a a huge part of our work and sometimes the workers will take notes um, briefly on their phone as they as they listen to the youth and speak with them um, but most of the time what happens is that after the session 
um, they will have to go back to the office either the same night or if they end very late the next day, then transfer all the notes or commit some to memory and then translate them onto the computer where we keep um, our outreach log on Microsoft Excel sheet. So this is a huge amount of time spent, as you can see, of repeated work where you type on the streets, type in the, the van on the way back and then type again on the Excel sheet. So that's one thing that we really wanted to try and improve with this app. Um, and also a big part of it was also that when different workers are engaging different youths, we cannot in real time get to see the different information that's being uploaded. So for example, I am in a corner of Tampines East and I'm engaging a group there. And then, you know, that has ended. I decide to join another group in Tampines West. By the time I get there, it's not like on the way in real time, I can get updated on the information because all the information can only be translated or transcribed later on. So that kind of prevents a seamless sharing of information amongst workers, which is actually really important when you're working so fluidly with different groups that you might have never met before on the streets. And the third pain point is also is sometimes a lot of unorganized files and forms. And as we all know, we all have a lot of reporting, um, quarterly reports, monthly reports, etc. And so it's quite difficult sometimes at the end of the month where we want to generate all this information to kind of um, an analyze report and everything is just a huge amount of information on excel sheet so that's how we kind of went to capel and kill safados and decided to start working on the app so yeah next slide this is the birth of the app otw and Right now, we're not really in our final stages. Uh, I mean, we're, we haven't launched the app yet, but why we decided to kind of share about this was because this app itself, um, we've gone through a lot of trial, which I think has been a very beautiful part of the process. When we work with Kilsa Fatos, there's a lot of back and forth um, because they really want to create an app that truly meets the needs of our team. And I think that is a critical part for everybody when you think about, you know, as an SSA with really so much work to do, how do we think of something that will value, really value add and not just take a tech because it's fun and it's exciting and it's new. Yeah. So next slide. The predicted hours saved when we finally launch it will be 20 hours per youth worker per month. And here there's a summary of what the app can do. So essentially really being able to access the information about locations, the spaces, the use on the go, and that will really help us to better engage the use, especially if we have never met um, before and it were, they were previously engaged by different staff instead. The second one is helping to eliminate the extra task of taking the field notes from our mobile phone app for whatever notes we decide to use and being able to just open the app and put in the information immediately. And that will also really increase better quality interactions with the youth. So beyond efficiency, we're also looking at increasing the quality of interactions between youth worker and the youth. Um, and lastly, there'll be an automated dashboard generator. So that'll be really helpful for both planning and management review as well. Yeah, so on to the next slide. So this is a very, you know, summer, summarized version of how we use the, the app. Um, the core function is really as we go on the streets and walk around, the youth worker might be able to check the app um, and see, oh, on the map recently in this area, block 356, there has been a lot of activity. It seems like it's a youth hotspot. Maybe we'll check this out today and see if that works out as well. Um, and then when they go there and you see a, a new group of youths, they can register the youth on the spot, including like um, being able to take photos of the spaces. Because sometimes you are in Singapore and a lot of places kind of look alike. Maybe it's just me because I'm bad direction, but I get confused. So sometimes having visual cues are very helpful as well. Um, then step three, the youth worker can also view and include details. Um, if let's say the youth was already registered, but they have new information about the youth, they can register that. And the step four is that as a supervisor, I can also very easily view the outreach log in, in real time or whenever I need to consolidate information instead of going to each staff and be like, oh, can I just check on that Monday outreach? Who were you meeting? How was it? I can better have a nice like, kind of spread of information to, to look at how to better share it with the management team above. Yeah, so next slide. Um, yeah, so here we have an exciting tagline of from silos to pipelines. This is a summary of really the key core components of the app. Um, I'll not go through all of them because you can kind of read it and I've already gone through some of it. But if I can make you look at the part about analysis, 
Actually, this is a part that has come as a big bonus as well. The idea to be able to tabulate numeric data automatically and to be able to key in the statistics just without having to take the extra step of transporting the data from Excel into whatever reports I need um, is something that I'm really looking forward to with all the reports that we have to do. Yeah, so I think in summary, in the next slide, um, a key part of this work, and I think the real value of it is that we've had the opportunity to start all the way at the beginning, which is a very precious part of the process um, that I think would make this app, if anybody else takes it up as well, uh, a really great value adding tool. Because what happened was that we managed to sit down with Kapel, Kilsa, Fatos, and be like, actually, what is the purpose of this app? What do we need it to do? What is it that it can help with in terms of our work? And really improved. Um, and then they really helped us to examine what the true values of our work are in that sense, because we then we realized that in, instead of just focusing on efficiency and time saved, which of course is great, we also wanted something that could improve the quality of interaction um, within the communities between youth worker and youth. So that led to the product and then the process. And then of course, um, on the back end, uh, Kilsa Fato was helping with the infrastructure, all the important smart technical stuff. Um, that has been a wonderful kind of experience being able to create something like that, like it's our combined baby. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to launch this. So the team has really been trialing it um, on outreach and working with Kilsa Fatos to really sharpen the app. So I will now pass the time to Philip so he can take you through the true technical parts of it because he's the expert. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Zing. Uh, this is a Philip Park. I'm leading the, the social inter interactive map initiative uh, on behalf of uh, FATOS and Kirsa uh, Consortium. Uh, if I just, uh, before I just introduce, I think it's also a pleasant uh, pleasant journey with the Boys Town uh, Youth Reach team to make really impactful solution. And they're also honored to be presenting our solution and passion for this interactive, interactive map. So uh, uh, FATOS and Kirsa Consortium, uh, Kirsa is a local project management team and the FATOS is a solution owner because we need most advanced edge uh, technology to, to address all these problems and issues that Singh uh, uh, commented. So I think uh, the Pato is owning the solution and we are managing the pro project very professionally, hands-on, and then, and then really close to the uh, Boys Town. So today, demo, I think, uh, I think we really only thoroughly try to understand what is the problems. Uh, based on the problems, uh, we try to give them, so we try to explain but uh, based on the scenario, what is kind of breakdown? I mean, we, we try to break down some sort of scenarios to address uh, the, the problems today. So before I just uh, go into walk into the uh, walk through the uh, detail uh, scenario, I think let just uh, let me just uh, open the, uh, the quick, quick video clip for your for your uh, brief understanding. All right, uh, let, let me just go into the uh, detail walkthrough. But before that, the, for your information, Mogos is the name of the, our I mean, digital map engine. So Fatos is the name of the company, the Mogos is the name of the solution, I mean, the engine technology, okay? Let me go. So for us, so we have uh, uh, four scenarios here today to show and share. So collecting data by taking geolocation. location. So for us, what do you understand is this? Today in the community work, whatever the institute it is, what is the key element? Actually, it's all about the kind of hands-on engagement activities. It's, it's all about day-to-day -day engagement with the community members, with the community social providers, right? So, so for us, whatever information, actually day-to-day, -day, every day, a lot of data information is created uh, in, on the street. On the street, 
in the HDB, in our, our, our town, uh, town area, our neighborhood. So it's all these kind of uh, data on spot. How do we collect all these information data more efficiently, easily for the, uh, so the, for the social worker to, to really focus on their own interaction with the community members, right? So the first thing, how to build up for us collecting data is how do we make the baseline and then that is in, uh, baseline information, the base, baseline information taking along with the geolocation information. Okay, so so for uh, uh, let me just go to the example that let's say our, in this case community worker, which is a youth worker, let's just they just want to about to start their task, their daily task. Let's say then then they, they open the uh, community map application. Then he will see the digital map first. So then I think definitely he, he, he or she must have some sort of a target location he wants to cover for that day, okay? Then they, we just try to give them very easy way to search the location or at least to find the location in the digital map, okay? Then let's say uh, from here, let's say he, he or she tried to go to some preschool. So then just by typing just a keyword of a preschool, the, the list will be shown. Then if it, that person selected that, that uh, exact uh, the location, then uh, the, the, the location will be pinned and then shown on the digital map right away. Then if you just touch and hold, it's, everything is a big fingertip. If he or she uh, touch and hold, then I think the pop-up registration pop-up will show up. Then if you just click the registration right away, you can register, okay? So let's say you just imagine that you just go to somewhere and then you want to just memorize this place, this location and register this location that because it's important and that there's something, some, some reason to register right away on the go on the mobile phone, you can just register like this. This is a kind of a location. And then there's a description, uh, information, profile, whatever for that location take along, we, we provide on the go very all everything and the interactive, okay? And then after that, uh, let's say uh, th this, after your registration, when, when, the person revisit the location, you can view again, just to touch the touch that, that location interactively that shows that, you know, you view this place, what kind of information is registered already previously. And then other youth workers and other, other social workers, when they just want to view what my colleagues register, they can also view as well, okay? So this is kind of baseline for the location. But how about the youth? For youth also, you have to make the very easy way to register youth that you encounter in the on the street or, or wherever wherever location they, they you really uh, are on spot right so we just give a very simple uh, the button that you just plus then you can just have this all this uh, information inputting uh, in the mobile phone okay this is this is kind of a mobile application right so then I think you can register the new youth very easily okay so this uh, location with the youth all their tech along with the location is a baseline for the uh, data collection and so called, okay? Then uh, for us is creating data. So creating data means for us what it is. For our definition, creating data is once you have a baseline of data that you, uh, from the daily engagement with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, daily engagement between social, uh, social worker, youth worker, and this uh, community members, how will you arrange? How will you utilize those data? Uh, based uh, for your business purpose. So the data, whatever you collect in the beginning, baseline data information should be well arranged for uh, uh, catering for the business purpose so that you can you can maximize the usage of a data. So for us, creating data is as in this baseline, the mobile app also have to enable, how do you, uh, how do you arrange, arrange the data, okay? So in, in, in for instance, if you look into the uh, registered youth, it, I think this map will show registered youth. Who are the registered youth? For you, our youth rich cases, what is the business purpose? They want to see, it's not about the individual youth. That is individual youth is a baseline. But how do they want to see the youth? By group. So what kind of common interest? What kind of, uh, what kind of a common interest? What kind of a program? Uh, those uh, group of the youth was uh, uh, associated they want to they want to see uh, registered youth as a group or at least a lot a lot to group each other okay so we try to give uh, customized function to to group and they create new group uh, and then 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 I think uh, based on based on the group I mean 
uh, each individual uh, youth also can be uh, can manage to belong to the group as a trust. So, so, so we we need to uh, give some sort of very customized function to to how do you use utilize this baseline uh, uh, data point, right? So this is kind of a collecting data for us. I mean, the creating data point. Third, data mapping, sharing, searching. So once this is more about repeated continuous improvement and the enhancement of uh, your data, okay? So, so uh, every day, every day you talk or go out, every week, every day. So think about it as a one year, two year, three years, the same street, same youth or new youth or new street, wherever I think the year, they, they go repeatedly go and then the data information will be created enormously. And then this should be well organized and they should be becomes more streamlined pool of information. So our social community information, it should be the stream, uh, streamlined, right? So, so for us is how do we build, how do we allow our community uh, uh, providers to, to build, uh, enhance uh, very continuously this kind of a data uh, and then share each other and then, then enhance, right? For instance, uh, so for, for even youth, you can just keep editing. You can just view, search, edit the, the profile of a youth, right? And then even for this youth, we can just add, hey, where, when, where we met this youth. So we can just add uh, where we met a location. We can just add the uh, locations that we met with this youth. And then different youth worker may, may encounter the same youth. Uh, I mean, the same different spot. We can all can integrate into the youth profile. Uh, with the data uh, data uh, uh, structure, okay. So this is uh, what we, and then they can be shown in the, the map, um, this map uh, 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 format, okay. So that it can be visualized very well. Uh, so so uh, the other workers also need to see whether very easily filter and then view the what kind of uh, youth was registered, etc. So that you know when we met the youth, whether it's a duplication of a registration, you know we have to avoid that. So we can just very easily find whether youth, this youth was previously registered. Yeah, then they keep keep adding information for this youth. Then after that is all the history, history for this youth, right? And then also need to give some sort of function for whether this youth should be belong to the new group, uh, and then etc. So so there must be some sort of very continuous enhancement of information. That is very very important for the enhancement of a community work. And the understanding behaviors of a youth. Okay. Okay. So, so I think let's say one year, two year, we don't see very short term. So let's say one year, two years, I think you have a very good pool of information, data, baseline, and then the uh, insightful, I mean, uh, the uh, very repeated uh, uh, information, in data information. What is needed for us is more futuristic, it should be more strategic. You have to have insight. Management has to view, monitor very well of all these community uh, information. Then I think they, they it should be further understanding of uh, behaviors. It, we call it insight and then implication. Then based on that, I think based on that they can create more strategic and futuristic program. They can they can be they can uh, enhance their 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 countermeasures and then they can enhance uh, all these. Uh, 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 behavioral uh, programs, etc., so that there is more proactive, uh, proactive development of uh, community works based on the past data. So we just want to give more analytic, analytic functions so that you know better decision making of um, uh, management, so that can they can be more futuristic. Okay, they can be more futuristic and more 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 uh, insightful. Okay, so for example. Uh, so let's say we can just provide some sort of outreach law and then management can uh, find the uh, views or and then sort out what kind of a locations been uh, uh, outreach, et cetera. So this is all the fun function of uh, filtering, sorting, so that management understand how we are doing, okay? Uh, and then this is kind of dashboard, okay? Then let's say we also can provide some sort of what is the more popular places. So let's say based on the older data, after one year, six months, two weeks, whatever, we can just show what is the most popular places. Then I think they, they can be very quickly understand, okay, actually the Tanjong Paga area is the most popular places. So let's just focus more online 
resources into the, that, that popular places like that. So it's a better understanding, uh, lead to the uh, better decision making process. This is what I'm going to do. So let's say track record, statistics, then even download the files of all these statistics so that management can have a better view, better, better management, more productive view, product manage, productive management. Okay. So, hello, sorry. So, so to wrap up, to wrap up, uh, to make it happen, we have a very uh, simple building blocks. To make it happen, it should be visualized. If the data information is not visualized, it's very difficult for the management to have a very seamless view and then analyze. So it should be visualized, digital map base, so that you know location, geolocation information is well kept along, so that we have a very, very insightful view of our community work. Okay, based on their territory, okay? And then everything should be, the data information, everything should be digitized so that we can have a very series of time. We, we pile up the baseline of the data that, they, that can be well used uh, with definitely with the protection of privacy uh, and the compliance, everything that should be well settled in, but everything should be digitized so that, I mean, I mean, there's no waste of the effort of our social workers. Okay, and then for youth, for case workers, for everyone, the whatever the solution it is, it should be well tailored, should be customized to shoot for their their business purpose. Otherwise, we just just use a Google Map. That's it. But what we the try that we we have to come up with some sort of com, some sort of combined solution together with a geolocation and digital map base, and then customize the workflow, work 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 management uh, functions all together as our solution. Okay, so that is a key building block and the element and principle and the philosophy that we want to put it in on, be, behind uh, on the way, on the way app. Okay. So uh, what our Patos and Kirsa consortium commitment is that definitely this, this app is not just one time, two time, short term, short term solution. We really want to have a co commit to the continuous improvement of this app. There might be more and more functions they might need. They really, really want to put it in as a more punctual digital map location uh, functions, etc. Then, because it's a map based, digital based database, it should be the accurate and it should be reliable. Reliable data we uh, we have to provide so that management has a better uh, better understanding and better management. Okay, and then we can enhance our community work and more and more. And then. We are proud of, uh, we are proud to support and contribute to this, all this community, I mean, Singapore community uh, enhancement, actually. And then we think this is kind of future of a community work. So, so we are passionate about supporting this community. And then at the end of the, ultimately, whatever technology it is, it should help that community workers and community solution providers, service providers has to, we have to help them to focus on their essential work, which is interaction with uh, community members. That is our ultimate goal. So the so technology cannot overrun, overtake our human being, uh, human human interactions. But we are uh, trying to provide a platform to, to enable better job, more focused job of our community uh, uh, workers. This is our kind of a pledge for, 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 for uh, interactive community lab. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ying and Philip. Wow, a huge thank you to all our guest speakers for your inspiring and exciting sharings. We hope that everyone is feeling enthusiastic about digital transformation in your agency, and specifically how you can address the pain points that were relevant to you from today's sharings. If that's you, NCSS is very happy to share a few more resources with you that you might find helpful in your journey. So let me now invite my colleague Lisa from the Digitalization Programs team to share more details with you. Lisa, please. Hello. Thank you so much for attending this session. I'm really uh, excited to see all the technologies. I hope you're excited as well. Okay, so now I'm going to share with you the funding and resources that you can tap on so that you can adopt this technology successfully. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to start off with the tax subsidy funding for SSAs. So firstly, you need to think which technology subsidy to apply. 
to, to help you decide that, right, uh, here are the rough uh, estimated pricing for all the system. Okay, for the case allocation system, it's about 36 to 40K for one year of usage. And then for three years of usage, it's 54 to 66K. Okay, and for the booking system, these are the estimated pricing. And finally, for the community map app, these are the estimated pricing. Okay, so with this information on the tech cost, then you will need to think whether do you want to use the technology for a year? Okay, for instance, if let's say you have an event, right, and you only need the, to use the Comet app, for example, just for a year, okay, then uh, perhaps you can consider tapping on the Start Digital Funding, where 80% of 40K, okay, will bring you to the 30K funding, yeah? But please note that, um, yeah, there's an asterisk here. This is a very important asterisk. Yeah, similar solutions uh, will not be funded three years from go live or adoption date. So, which means that you must be very clear you only want to use the solution for one year. If not, then uh, NCSS highly recommend that you go for Grow Digital so that you can use the solution for a longer period of time. Okay, uh, as well as perhaps you need to want to include more customization for your system, then you can have a higher funding amount at 450k per solution. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just to give you more information on the tax subsidy. Uh, please note that it's a three-year funding sliding scale where the first year is 80% and the second and third year is at 50%. Okay, and application is open all year round in the OSG grant portal. For Start Digital, um, while the maximum fundable amount is 30k per solution, okay, the, there is actually an overall cap per SSA at 150k, which means that you can tap on the start digital for multiple times for multiple solutions, but at a maximum fundable amount of 30k. So because of that, we actually cap the funding amount, right? It's a fast free application where you only need to submit one quotation and choose for, from your preferred vendor. So it's really easy to apply, okay? But uh, as I said, uh, since this system may require higher customization and you want to use longer period of time, you can consider applying for Grow Digital where the funding amount is at 450K per project. But for this, you will need to submit three comparable quotation and also fill up the Op Health framework for social services if you have not, not done so if your tech cost is more than 90K. And these are the KPIs for Grow Digital Project. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I think just now from the sharing, you all have heard Kapel a couple of times, yeah? So all the SSAs who have uh, adopted all this technology actually has really partnered Kapel very closely to come up uh, with the solution because we know every SSA has different needs, yeah? So, uh, and social workers especially, all of you are really very busy. And to really sit down to help you think through what are the needed requirements, what specs should go in and what specs to prioritize really will take a lot of time. And furthermore, having a third-party consultant will really help you to think outside the box and also identify blind spots that may, you may not have seen it earlier. Yeah. So um, if you need that support, uh, you can tap on the pre-scope consultancy funding, okay, where we have appointed Capel Thunder Code uh, in this uh, consultancy. Yeah. So if you are looking at start consultancy, it will help you to scope the project as well as select the solution. Yeah. But if you need more deep dive support, like those support that Zing has mentioned, really start from the beginning. What is the value that you want the solution to bring you? Really start from a blank piece of paper. Yeah, very deep dive support. Then you will go with Grow Consultancy. Okay. And also um, for Grow Consultancy, it includes implementation support as well, as well as the most important change management. Yeah, so for Grow Consultancy, Capel Thunder Code will actually support you all the way until the end, until your KPI, meet KPI. Just now I showed you the KPI earlier, right? Yeah, the KPI timeline, it really 
support you all the way. And second point that is important also if it is an inter if you already have a few solution currently in your SSD, how do I integrate all the solution together? Again, this really requires extensive consultancy support where growth consultancy will be more appropriate. Yeah. So the subsidy is at 80% per project. Uh, so uh, the SSAs is, can will co-pay around 7 to 23K, really depending on the scope and complexity of your project. The detailed price schedule will be uh, sent to you after you attend a complimentary uh, clinic, which I will share more detail in the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just a quick overview of the application process for consultancy. So first up, um, you will need to attend a mandatory uh, clinic. Yeah, this is totally free. So if you are keen to talk to Kapel and Thunderquote, please you can scan the QR code now and book your slot. Yeah, and after you attend the clinic, if you decided to proceed with the consultancy support, then you will submit the OSG application. And it will take us about six weeks to process. And once it's approved, we will need to sign some documents, which is the scope of work document and the NCSS funding agreement. Subsequently, then the uh, engagement of the consultancy will commence. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now I will move on to talk about funding for charities. Next slide. For charities, the non-NCSS members, you can tap on the Start Digital ICT where the uh, funding amount is 40k per charity at 80% funding level. For Start Digital ICT, you also only need to submit one quotation and choose any vendor of your choice and you can submit your application via OSG all year round. And if you need a higher funding quantum, you can go for Go Digital Charities where the funding amount is at 300k per charity and submit three comparable quotations via the Form SG. Okay, please note that for Go Digital Charities, if you are really keen to have a higher funding amount, you would need to contact NCSS first because there are additional instructions involved for Go Digital Charity. So please don't do anything first contact NCSS if you are keen to apply for Go Digital Charities. Next slide, please. Okay, for charities, if you need support from consultants, we have also pre-appointed consultant, which is Thunderquote and Design Sojourn. So uh, for the charities consultancy, we have a fully funded technical advisory limited to one slot per, per charity. And for technical advisory, it is similar to start digital consultancy for SSAs where the consultant will help you to scope the project as well as select which technology to choose. So for instance, there's this testimonial here yeah, where a charity was really struggling on what are the requirements and which selection to which technology to choose. And yeah, so it's really a lot of uh, hard work because they are not familiar, right? Yeah, a lot of people are doing this for the very first time so you really do not know what, uh, where to start. So with the consultancy support, then they can really come in to support you with all their expertise because all these consultants actually work with many other charities as well. Then they can help you choose the technology that can meet your needs and you can reap the benefits. Okay. Um, now I think it's the end of my... Oh, sorry. There's still one last slide, which is on the application process. The, uh, to sign up for the uh, technical advisory, there's also a clinic, which is complimentary as well, okay, where you can either meet design surgeon or thunder code or meet both. So after you meet both consultants, then uh, you can decide whether or not you want to proceed with the consultancy, and then you will click here to apply, and then after, it will take us six weeks to process, and after signing the needed document, yeah, the engagement with the consultant will commence. And please note, yeah, shout out to all the charities. There is a deadline, okay, on the 31st March 2023. So this 2023, which is this year, by the way, yeah, please apply soon because it's closing already. So if you really want to get the consultancy support, please apply as soon as possible. Yeah, so I believe I have arrived to the last slide of my presentation. 
So now I would like to invite Su Ling, the Senior Assistant Director from the Digitalization Programs team to do a bit of sharing. Su Ling, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We're happy to see so many of you today. Today, we have a lot of good content. I would like to summarize and give key takeaways from another angle. So I would like to start off saying, uh, putting a CEO of Salesforce, Mark Benioff, who once said that every digital transformation starts and ends with the customer. And I see it in the eyes of every CEO. This resonates with the sharing by the SSAs earlier, underlying their motivation to adopt service delivery tech like the community map app is their desire to serve the clients, service users faster and better. And when the frontline staff can spend less time on the manual admin tasks, they can spend more time serving the service users. And based on our interactions with SSAs, we see that it's getting more urgent to digitize or digitalize their front end services and processes because caseloads are not coming down, complexity of cases are increasing, service users have higher expectations, staff retention is getting more and more difficult. And it doesn't help that our frontline social service professionals face high risk of burnout. So in this very challenging environment for social service agencies, I will encourage all of you to seriously consider the technology that we shared earlier so that you can serve your clients faster and better. Thank you. Back to you, Lisa. Okay, how about, um, let me share a little bit more about the OHFSS and the OHDS while Lisa uh, comes up. So um, I think as Lisa has shared previously in some of the slides for the resource sharing on digitalization, um, there is a need to um, actually take the self-assessment on the OHFSS. So we have already uh, shared in the chat as well, uh, the links that you can click to find out more about each of these uh, schemes and initiatives. Okay, so I think now uh, it will be a great time to move into our Q&A segment and uh, we will be sharing the pigeonhole Q&A details again for your reference if you missed it earlier. Um, and you can also click the link in the Zoom chat for your easy access. So now I will leave it to Lisa to facilitate this segment. Lisa, please. Hello, I'm back again. Yep, so uh, now let me just go straight to the uh, pigeonhole to start asking the questions. Okay, so um, now let's start off with Ziying. There's a question that's posted to you. What is Boys Town trying to evaluate and analyze through the help of the app? Ziying? That's a great question. Sorry for the background noise. We were in an open office. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so basically, actually the main thing that we want to analyze would actually be the youth trends in the spaces that they occupy. Because what we find on outreach is that um, youths are very mobile, very fluid with their bikes and, and all that. So sometimes it could be a specific area, like say the Central Park is an area that a lot of youths hang, hang out at or one particular group likes to dominate. But in one or two months, sometimes weeks, they will end up moving and we go back to the same space at the same time and they're not there anymore. So we use the app to be able to visually see and analyze um, whether there's any trends to the way they move around and what are the hotspots. So that helps us uh, in planning our outreach sessions so that maybe we don't have to spend so much time driving around only to find um, that we can't find any use. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Suying. That's all right. Next question is posted to uh, Philip, I believe it would be about the combat app. Yeah. So the question is the problem with free text is that it can be too worthy to make meaningful analysis. How can we resolve this and analyze the rich data from the notes? So how do you do that, Philip? Uh, 
Uh, I think he doesn't have his video on at the moment. So maybe we go to another question first before we spotlight him. Okay, sure. Can, no problem. So uh, maybe now let me move on to this question because subsequent question are all... Um, okay, maybe for this question, I'll get Emil. Emil, I hope you have your... Uh, yeah, I'm on. here. <laughs> okay, yep. so the question is, uh, at, for example, your booking system, how can the system be integrated with our existing software? And oh. also how, I think there's a question that I saw about Microsoft also as well. Mm. Yeah. How do you actually uh, integrate it using Microsoft? to How do you integrate with Microsoft? So can you answer that question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I shine cloud. Yeah, I have worked with them before. It's uh, what we do is that we actually arrange uh, a discussion with your IT vendor or whoever you're using, like iShine Cloud, etc. And basically, work out the connection points we need to get things to work. So connecting to Microsoft, for example, actually requires us to set up a application on the, on the what you call the Active Directory, right? So I try, I try not to be too techy, lah, right? I mean, but, um, but the idea is that you assign, a, a, assign like a key and a passcode of sort that's assigned to the application. And the application will be will use those to basically negotiate the rights to do uh, connections, like set up a calendar appointments, check the bookings. And in terms of other integrations, for example, let's say you're using CareSense from iShine Cloud. I mean, I see since I see the work at iShine Cloud here. And you're interested in doing certain, maybe certain kinds of interactions, like uh, connecting your contact data or things like that. Yeah, we... There, there is an opportunity to explore as long as uh, basically right from the start we need to discuss and see what kind of connections you want. It's basically about design, right? So if you say I want to sync my data with my client data and then put all my client data into the appointment system, it is definitely possible. It's just a matter of framing it, how you're going to do it, right? And uh, I mean, I've, I've been, we have been also been approached for other kinds of integration. I think some of the other concerns can also include things like um, making sure that the data is compatible with SSNet, et cetera, you know, importing your SSNet reports into the system. And these are things that we can arrange and discuss as well. Yeah. Okay. That's for the integration with, that's, I believe that's, that's the question on the Microsoft integration and integration of existing software, correct? Yeah. Yeah, correct. Uh, I believe that uh, Philip is still not back. So I'm sorry that uh, I'm not able to answer this question. There's a question that's posted to me. Uh, which I will have uh, Su Ling to answer this question. Okay, so what's the question is, what is the running cost of the app per year on year after the initial, okay. The running cost of the app per year, okay, uh, is about, um, if you take the slide just now, the amount, right, you can just divide by two, or the, uh, divide by two. Yes, it's about 12K per year, okay. This is just a rough estimation. Yeah, and the next question is what will be covered in the maintenance of the app? Okay, oh, okay, uh, the maintenance, or uh, maybe I also get Emil to answer. Uh, then, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, the question is what will be covered in the maintenance? Okay, yeah, so what's covered in maintenance? All right, so basically, this is a, a few things. As you can see, this is a, this system is an ongoing running system. Right, so there are certain things that can change in the scenario. Like I think recently, uh, as you are aware, Singapore has, uh, you may not be aware, right? Okay, right. As Singapore has actually uh, has been trying to fight uh, SMS scams, right? And since my system actually relies a lot on SMS, I have to negotiate and make sure that certain trends are adhered to. So one of the things that's been pattern is happening is that they are requiring all people to register and their messages, their ID to a, to like a directory or so, and to, to prove that you actually own the handler. So just now when I was sending the messages, it actually came from this handler called TQ Certainty that's belonged to me. When uh, AWA sends their messages, it's actually sent by AYFSC, right? So I had to, basically there's a process where they, you need to register and all that and the maintenance will cover basically any of these changes that require us to adjust it. The maintenance will also cover things like, um, like addressing any issues or bugs like along the way because this software we develop it from from scratch right and there may be of course as you use it there may be some issues that may have some problems and um also okay i, I can't speak i can't i can't really speak for kilsa and fatos but for our site also 
for our maintenance, right? We also do cover like a like for example, you have some feature requests or suggestions, etc. Right throughout the throughout the process, and you say I want to continue upgrade the process or my processes are changed. And what we normally will do is that we'll 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 see whether uh we can use some of the unused maintenance hours and negotiate maybe we can make, make adjustment to the system. And because this system is kind of shared between a few different agencies, not just AY. If you have a suggestion for a, a system and maybe another FST has a suggestion for a system, and we found that there's, there's commonalities, we can use some of this maintenance to actually fund and upgrade to the system as well, right? This is this basically how, how, how the philosophy we work with, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Emil. Um, yeah, so I think uh, Philip is back here with us. So uh, Philip, I think I will direct a few similar questions to you. I think um, people want to know how can they tell uh, the connections for the youths have grown over time um, and the types of activities the youths are engaged in and what they're good in and their hobbies and interests. So I think this relates a bit to um, the data collection and the data visualization aspect. So maybe you could share a bit more from Kilsa. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, sorry. I, I was... Uh, I was uh... I didn't speak out later, uh, last time. Okay, so uh, thanks for the question first. Uh, the first question is uh, from the top, uh, types of activities youth are engaged in. So there are that various types of engage, uh, activities, but I think that second uh, category, number three, what the youth good in and what hobbies interest, actually there's an answer. Right now, in our youth profile, we try to, uh, we try to give uh, some sort of uh, Parameters to put what is their interests, what is their hobbies. So their their hard information means that they tick tick tick. So we just can provide some sort of a, a fixed parameters of uh, interest uh, and the hobbies, or we can have some open text so that we can just put oh these these uh, these youth actually or I think we encounter this youth in the uh, uh, bas basketball court, but they are smoking. So they are quite open uh, engagement, open activities. That we can notice that one you also want to capture. Okay, there's a very open text. Although, uh, if we want to have very frequent uh, activities and engagement that we already have, we can put it in as a parameters, fixed parameters, and we can keep clear. Then it's a very structured information. So it depends on the really demand for what kind of uh, youth, uh, what kind of uh, activities of youth uh, engaged in. Okay, hopefully, hopefully, you can uh, uh, answer very briefly. But I think definitely we are open to, uh, uh, I mean, to deal with all these questions later as well. Okay. Uh, the third one, uh, the second one is the problem with the, no. Um, okay, how can you tell the connections for the youth have grown over time? So maybe this question is about after we launch app, right? How we can see, how can see the more and more connections youth, right? Also there are two, uh, two aspects. Is that connections between youth and youth, or is connections with our social community uh, providers, and let's say community workers or youth workers, right? Both we have to have, uh, we have to uh, see uh, how we can see the growing of uh, connections because all these uh, connections actually in the other other era, other uh, other than the youth reach. I think we have another project actually also that one is really focused on the connections. Uh, more than the uh, activities and, and engagement is connections between the community members. So we can, if you are asking about the more connections between the youth, that one is actually now for space for us is a grouping first based on the common interest, common hobbies. So there's a first connections through the common interest group. Okay, but later the connections can be very more in more sophisticated way, like, like hey, uh, these uh, youth have this kind of uh, 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 interest, and then this youth is looking for some need or some friend, then I think we, we, we may need to design some sort of uh, the kind of a connection parameters and algorithm, then we can, we can just recommend oh, for this youth, we can recommend this uh, another another pal in the similar uh, zone, uh, so similar similar location. We can recommend, and then we can ask. Uh, we can just give some of the youth workers to connect them each other, something like that. So that one is the second phase. Right now, we we group grouping first. 
based on the uh, uh, based on the common interests and the hobbies. But uh, in the other project, we are already working on some sort of very connection or uh, connecting between community members each other based on the uh, uh, based on the need and pain. Okay. Hopefully I can and yeah. so yeah briefly. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Philip. Okay, so I think um in view of time as well, we will probably just cover two more questions. Mm -hmm. So the first one is to Sean um about the case allocation system. So I think uh the question asks. For the reporting, what's the level of customizability supported? For example, how easy is it for us to change the field or columns or break down the settings? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I think the uh, flexibility is there and is uh, I would say it's very easy that because uh, we have really built up uh, the base uh, by all the parameters, all the variables. So uh, upon request, we can edit on very easily. So it's more like a, a switch on, switch off kind of thing. Yep. So at the back of our configuration, we already have almost every one of the, the parameters ready. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, so now I think we will go to the last question and I will let uh, Suling take that question. Okay, so this question is about the grow consultancy. The question asks, will the solutions recommended be from Capel or Thunder Quote and will they recommend vendors after the consultancy? Thanks for the good question. So what works for AWA may not work for uh, Mumford Care? Every, every SSA is different. So essentially, the consultancy will actually advise the technology according to the SSA's needs. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Suling. Okay, so I think we have now come to uh, close to the end of our session. Um, we would like to show you the QR code for our feedback form. Okay, um, and we would hope that you will participate. Um, and as we show you the QR code, uh, you can also take note of the different emails that you can use to contact us on um, OHDS, OHFSS related uh, matters or any um, CCF and Tech and Go matters. Uh, and while you're doing that, um, we will also be sharing the, Q the QR code, the feedback form link in the chat. Yeah. So I'll give you everyone a few minutes to uh, scan the QR code and uh, type in your feedback uh, for us today. And at the same time, um, we could also share with you a little bit more about what's upcoming uh, for our Tech Up series. So um, as you will see in the slide, we're actually having uh, two digital fitness workshops uh, in March and in April. So for the first workshop, we'll be looking at how do you project manage um, digital transformation and um, adopting digital products uh, in your agency. So there will be um, uh, support in how you can perform comprehensive technical assessments and evaluate vendors and implement all these uh, projects so that you can have a successful outcome. Um, and, and in the second workshop, uh, we're going to look at service delivery technology, and that will be in April. So um, you will be learning how to integrate person-centered active support principles and transform your services through technology. So um, you, will, you will be receiving our EDMs, and actually today we have blasted uh, the first round out. So do look out for that. Uh, it will be great if you could join us for these two workshops. Yes. Okay, so I think um, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so once again, uh, appreciate your feedback and uh, we have come to the official end of today's session uh, and we will be uh, looking forward to seeing you in the next Tech Up series or Capability Circles. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Okay, see whether they are. Hi.